Right, good evening everyone and welcome to uh, our next Q&A with Nigel Travis and Mark Devlin. Uh, Q&A comes off the back of the update from the boards that came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, we got a lot of questions, well over 100, a lot of which were, were similar or the same. So we condensed them down into about 50 or so. so if we get straight into it, um, Nigel, Mark, first of all, thanks for joining me. Uh, question one relates to the new stadium. So what sites have been considered for the new stadium? What OK, so uh, firstly, can I thank uh, everyone, George, and just let everyone know I'm joined by our CEO, Mark Devlin. Um, we're going to rattle through these questions fairly quickly because we've got so many. So I apologise up front if they lack a bit of heart, but we're going to get straight to the answers. So the, the first one is we're still looking at sites. Um, we've got several in the area. We've got one that's, uh, let's say, very close to the stadium. And we're working with Waltham Forest on uh, several sites. They've given us sites throughout the borough, uh, some of which they control, some of which we don't control. Uh, sorry, they don't control. I think for me to actually name the specific sites is probably unfair because there may be residents who... Uh, are going to be warned that we may go closer to them and maybe commercial uh, owners and tenants who don't know anything about this. So all I would say is Waltham Forest have been extremely cooperative. We're very optimistic. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a good start to the, the process, which I want to reiterate will be very long. Perfect. Thank you, Nigel. So similarly, to that, what capacity do we believe may be required for a new stadium? I think Mark's the best to answer that one. Uh, when we're looking at um, capacity of 17,000 with the ability to go north of that uh, as, as, um, as the club gets more successful and as our fan base grows, we'd like to have the ability to grow that number. But we're kind of looking at a, a base start number around the 17,000 mark <clears throat> with facilities that allow us to, uh, as we call it, sweat the asset and use the stadium uh, 365 days a year, seven days a week. And uh, so that's the kind of initial capacity. But it's important to know that our aspirations are also to try and find a site that would allow us to grow that as, as, and, when we, uh, as and when we can. Meet. Great. Thank you, Mark. Next one is stadium related as well and says, AFC Bournemouth have got to the Premier League with a small stadium, so why do we need a new one? Good question, and I think it's fair to say, to add to the question, Luton have done the same. Uh, just so that everyone knows, and I'll do this in rough numbers, we basically have, let's say, 9,000 in round numbers. Bournemouth, I think, has 10, and Luton has 11, or it may be the other way around. But... <laughs> It's so, OK, so the point's a good one that the question asks. I think it's fair to say that one of the things that we said very clearly at the fan forum the other week is that we believe that we have to have a sustainable model. Uh, I want to reiterate to everyone on the call that I'm a fan. Uh, our consortium bought the club to save the club. And we don't want anything bad to happen to Lake Orient. So sustainability is very important to us. And Bournemouth, and if anyone's listening, they take exception to my comments. I apologise up front. Have taken very big financial losses to achieve the Premier League because they haven't got the revenue to sustain it. So it's required a lot of investment from their investors and fair play to them. They've done very well. Uh, I think it's also fair to say that uh, as another model, which you could say is the Brentford Brighton model, Mark, who was at Brentford for seven years, is extremely well versed with how they worked on their project. So we're using that as the model. And as far as I'm concerned, um, that is a really good model because it was London based. So we're going to follow that. I think the only other thing I would add, and I think some other questions relate to this, we could stay where we are, but the cost of it is just ridiculous. And at the end of the day, you have to take everything into account. And we want our fans to enjoy the experience. It will be years of 
torture by having parts of the stadium closed. We would lose money as a result of that. So even though we started with the premise that we should expand the stadium, we concluded very quickly it wasn't going to work. I think we may have lost your audio there, Nigel. Oh. I oh, know you're back now. Yeah. So which where did you lose it, George? Uh, we lost you probably about 30 seconds ago, I'd say. Okay, I was going to say, OK, we started with the premise that we would stay at Brisbane Road or what's now called the Gold Group Stadium. And uh, it just didn't work financially. Uh, it would also mean a lot of disruption to our fans, uh, as well as the cost of shutting down parts of the ground. So we concluded and the board all, by the way, voted on this, that we should should decide to move. OK, great. Thanks, Nigel. We'll stick. We're going to skip question four on your sheet. We'll come back to that. So we'll stay with the stadium. So number five, if a new stadium is a long term project, will we make improvements to Brisbane Road in the meantime? OK, so Mark and Steve Tate, as our CEO, have done some great work on this. So I'm going to let Mark explain that. Nigel. Um, yes, we do plan. Uh, we mentioned this to the supporters groups a week or so ago. Uh, we accept that the East Stand uh, is not of a standard that we would all like. So we, um, uh, Steve Tate particularly has worked with our stadium operations team uh, on coming up with a plan both in the home and, and away areas uh, of the East Stand. Um, and we will be looking to make those improvements literally as soon as our home season has ended and, uh, and and thanks to Richie and the players that may get extended but as soon as that's ended um, the builders are, have been selected went through a tender progress process sorry have been selected and we will be spending roughly half a million pounds on improving facilities in the east stand we're also looking at improving bar facilities in the south stand courtesy of what will be a, a new relationship with a new pouring rights partner um, that we will uh, sign later towards the end of this uh, season and there may be some other minor improvements around the stadium as well um, all aimed at uh, particularly in the <clears throat> in the west north and south making people more comfortable being able to generate more revenue being able to provide a better service off the field in the east end um, approximately 20 25 percent of the half million pounds that it's likely to cost us will go into improving things like the toilets and the infrastructure there. So it won't all be revenue generating, but we accept that we need to improve those facilities. It will also allow us, we hope, having involved the council at an early stage in our conversation, to uh, sell out the maximum capacity over in the East End. We currently are unable to sell around four to 500 seats every game because there is a cap on our capacity due to safety constraints and so forth. So part of this will will hopefully see all of that uh, return to us, four or 500 extra people in the East stand and much better facilities. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'll stick with you for this next one as well, which relates to safe standing. Um, one supporter asked, could the introduction of safe standing increase the, pass increase the capacity at Brisbane Road? Yeah, I can understand. I have this. I mean, I would much prefer to stand at a football match than sit. But the fact of the matter is we've got an all seater stadium and um, with safe standing. The only way it would make financial sense, because it would be relatively expensive to install it, is if we could fit more people in the stadium. But the capacity is actually based on the uh, facilities and the concourses. And what we what you can't do is have any more people in the stadium and then find that the concourses become unsafe pre-match and at half time and also for supporters leaving the stadium so for the moment <clears throat> we're looking at improving the, uh, the stadium facilities as I mentioned with the last question but safe standing is not uh, currently on, in our thinking when it comes to the new stadium I have to say that we will uh, potentially look at um, safe standing areas both in home areas and away areas but we're some way off planning for that but that would be something that we the, an aspiration for the new stadium not for um, anything at, at, uh, at Brisbane Road George, can I just jump in and say, 
I think one of the things that everyone should be clear about, we all talk about the new stadium. We should assume we're going to be at Brisbane Road for at least 10 years. So I think that's very important for all our supporters to know because Mark has told me many times the process at Brentford took 17 years. If we can get a site quickly, we can bring that down. But let's assume we're there for 10 years. You're on mute, George. George, you're on mute. Technical difficulties. Thanks for that, Nigel. Um, next question is from a fan who asks, at the time the North and South stands were built, it was talked about second tiers potentially being added to them. Is this possible? Um, firstly, I think it's a great question again. Um, and I know we've kind of looked at it. Mark actually had a, a group of building surveyors look at every option. So I'm going to let him answer it because it's a bit beyond my skis this one so mark okay so the short answer is the south stand because of the nature of the buildings behind it there's no no chance of adding a second tier at all to the south stand the architects have looked at that it's just not feasible the only way we could do it at the north stand would be to knock down a whole host of houses behind the north stand um and i'm not referring now to the properties in windsor road i'm referring in the north stand more or less just before the North Stand car park, there are some housing units there for uh, the council operated for vulnerable adults. They would all have to be demolished. We'd probably have to look at knocking down one of the sets of blocks of flats. So the, the short answer to that is it's highly unlikely, understandable that someone would ask the question, but highly unlikely that um, that would be uh, something we'd be able to do. OK, hey, thank you. Mark. Um, so, so next question. So just to summarise the section on the stadium, I would say uh, next question is from a fan who simply asked, why do we want to leave Brisbane Road? <laughs> uh, I think that's where I started, George. Um, and I think, you know, the simple reason is, one, we're in a situation whereby we have a new, assuming we get a deal with the Premier League and the EFL, we have a new thing called a squad cost ratio coming, which the biggest part of that is revenue. Revenue comes from a number of sources. Revenue comes from the league. It comes from buying and selling players. It comes from hospitality. It comes from selling merchandise. It comes from bars but principally it also comes from attendance and we are limited. And if you compare the league we're in now with the teams we've got, we've got teams with much bigger stadiums like Charlton, like Bolton, Derby, um, et cetera, because they got bigger stadiums, they can have bigger crowds and that means they have more revenue. So if we're to stay competitive, we need to have more space to grow. So that's the principal reason. The second reason is the London Borough of Waltham Forest has plans for 5,500 homes in the next few years next to our stadium, basically, within half a mile to be exact. And we all know of some flats being built right behind the West Stand. They also expect to have other housing within the Leighton area. So it's not just within half a mile. So we're believing we're going to have a lot more demand for tickets in the future. Leighton's also going to build up its transportation. There's a 14 million pound uh, renovation of uh, Leighton Stadium, a uh, station. And we think that's going to bring in a lot more fans. At the moment, we're effectively doing no marketing because we sell out every game. So it's revenue capacity is the true reason. We'd love to stay at Brisbane Road, but it's too difficult, cost prohibitive, and would disrupt all our fan experiences for many years is the summary of everything. Can I just add, George, uh, to be fair to the marketing team, <laughs> 
we are doing some marketing. Um, we we still have to sell out certain games. We still have to work hard. And as Nigel has said constantly, we still have to work on getting people to actually attend once they purchase the ticket. And that's probably a, a bigger challenge still. So plenty of marketing going on. But the opportunity, it, could, if I add my own opinion here, the club will simply stand still and be bypassed if if we um, are unable to play in a bigger stadium. Uh, I think everyone understands the emotion attached to uh, our spiritual home. No one wants to leave Brisbane Road. It's a, it's a case that if we want to grow the club, be competitive in the future, we are going to have to grow. And, and sadly, it looks highly unlikely that we're going to be able to achieve that on the current footprint. So uh, I just want it to be fair to the marketing department as well. who are obviously trying to work wow. hard to ensure that we get bums on seats uh, for all our games. So, Mark, why have you suddenly become soft? You're always accusing me of being soft. <laughs> there's, a t- there's a time and a place to, uh, for that, Nigel. Yeah, I think I'll just add one thing. Football continues to grow. If you actually look at the attendances through the Premier League, every ground that's changed, moved, like the Emirates, they're now at 98, 99% capacity. EFL attendances go up every year. Football is becoming more and more popular worldwide. And just as a completely erroneous fact, um, this weekend, Dean Smith, who, of course, was our assistant manager for many years, is now the manager at Charlotte in the MLS. Not the most attractive team in the MLS, I would say. They had 68,000 for a home game this weekend. So football is booming and will get even bigger in the future. Perfect. Thank you, Nigel and Mark, for that one. Uh, next one's a more footbally one. So, Mark, I'll come to you first of all. Um, this fan asks, would you be content winning the playoffs this year and struggling in the championship next season? Or would you rather we stay in League One and develop first of all? Uh, Did you say that was me or Mark? No, I think, I think George threw it my direction, Nigel. So I'll, yeah, we'll I'll come jump to on Mark this and I'll pass on to you, Nigel. So it's a personal opinion because Nigel's opinion may differ. I I don't care how we get into the championship. I and I've said this last night on a podcast that I was on. I think we've got the quality of staff off the field to cope with uh, going up a, a league, and uh, Richie certainly got a group of staff despite. Uh, your group of players, I should say, sorry, despite all the uh, suspensions and injuries we've had uh, to, to challenge at the top end of League One and get us into the championship. And if we get there with smart recruitment, there's no reason why we would struggle. We shouldn't assume that we will. It will be incredibly tough, the championship. We will have one of the smaller budgets. But if you're smart about your recruitment, and that's back to the Brentford model, really, if you're smart about your recruitment and how you go about it, if you've got quality coaching staff which we believe we have uh, there's no reason why we can't go into the championship and be competitive no one no one's saying we're going to run through it and get into the premier league um but we can there's no reason why we would necessarily struggle it's all about you know how you recruit how you spend the money you've got not just about having lots of money although that clearly helps so i i'd be very happy to go up through the playoffs it would be a wonderful challenge for the playing staff and for all of us behind the scenes. But if it means we wait a year and uh, and go up as uh, champions or go up and get promoted automatically next year, so be it. But as I was keen to point out yesterday, for, on a personal basis, I'm not frightened about getting into the championship. I do think we've got some stellar staff off the field to support the aspirations uh, of the football side. Yeah, my answer is basically the same. Um... Perhaps I have a bit more historical context. I mean, you've got to remember, we bought the club in the National League. We've outperformed my expectations, which I think I said at the start of the season was to consolidate in League One. We've done our recruitment, as you say, Mark, very well this year. We've got some terrific young talent and we intend to get some more on the basis of that. And I appreciate, by the way, all the supporters sort of writing on various forums and things about that young talent we have and also all their support, which is very important. I think we have a first class coaching staff. Uh, We all talk about Richie, but Paul Terry, Matt Harold, 
Uh, we have great people like Keaton who leads our medical staff all supporting it. And then there's the whole system of the academy. And I want to reiterate that the academy qualified for what's called the Merit League as, as two youth leagues that basically go parallel through the season and then the top half splits and plays the other top half for only the second time in the last few years we've qualified. So that says we've got some really good talent and a young man whose uh, name I've forgotten, who's uh, he, one of those young players, he turned out for Jamaica uh, over the weekend. So we feel good about it. I agree with Mark's answer. And talking to Wickham, uh, they actually made money in the championship. But the reason why everyone's nervous about it, and I've said it many times, the average loss in the championship is 20 million. Great. Thank you both for your answers there. Um, the next question is an investor related one. So it's number four on your question sheet, which is, will any new investors have to abide by the principles that we declared in our recent mission statement? which are community, togetherness, excellent, transparency and challenge? Well, the answer is yes. We don't have to sell. The only reason we're looking for a lot of investment is none of us, uh, unless Mark's going to surprise me on this call by saying he's suddenly got it, has got the odd hundred million hanging around. Um, so the way we've actually set this up as, as a much smaller amount we're raising in the short term. I think it's probably not right to actually share the number we're raising. Uh, but we're looking to bring some investors in um, who will effectively join the other group of investors that we have. And that's to cover the next two and a half years while we carry on the work, which, by the way, I want to reiterate what I said before. It's going really well. Mark's doing a great job on the training ground and the stadium and effectively appropriately is leading the charge there but it all takes time uh, so we're raising a smaller amount and then a much bigger amount and the estimate is 100 million if we move stadium uh, because obviously we have to find a site so that's why i said if and we also have to find someone who's that kind of money but they're all being told about our history about about our mission, about our community, our togetherness, our excellence, transparency, etc. The fact that we do, the fact we do podcasts, I wouldn't say is unique, but not many clubs do it. Uh, it's also interesting that George gave me a financial publication. I talked to them last week and they want to do uh, an article on our fan engagement. He thought the way we did some of the things that we do are unique. So that's a third party view. Uh, and he was very enthusiastic about the way that we work with the fans. Uh, I think part of it is the fact I believe in this thing called the challenge culture. I think part of it is I've always dealt with franchisees and I always talk about the two F's, which are fans and franchisees. They're very similar. They're very passionate and have financial involvement. So we will do everything we can to make sure we balance getting the money and keeping the culture that we have at the club, which I have to say, I think has been very successful. Staying on investment, Nigel. So I'm going to combine two questions for the next one. So one fan asks, will a new investor have a majority share from the start? And another fan asks, does this search for investment mean the club is up for sale? OK. Number one. The answer is no. We've made this very clear. And last week I had a group of prominent players who were approached by a third party. And they said, yeah, we want to take over this club. We've got all these players, all of and by the way, all these players, our fans would know who they are. I mean, they're very well known. And I said, no, that's not the way we do things. Um, uh, we think we've got certain skills that your group may not have. But most important is the culture we have. And, you know, we're not willing to take a risk. We went down that route once before, just in case anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about. We had a group of people who ran the club before we ran it that we don't actually mention the names. Um, and it was a complete disaster. 
as a fan, I went through it, hated every minute. That is not what Leighton Orient is about. So the answer is no. And I think the answer to the second question is slightly different. If someone comes along, helps build the stadium, uh, at some stage, uh, the majority may well go to someone else. I mean, full transparency, I'm 74. Um, going back to the earlier question, my wife reminds me every day that <laughs> clubs lose 20 million a year in the championship, and Mark's heard her say that. And I also want to say, cause in case anyone thinks badly of her, she's been the biggest supporter of me investing in Leighton Orient all through the years. And I think I and others owe her a big thanks because she's she loves the club. And one of my favourite things every week is I'm watching the game and she'll creep in and say, how's it going? Um, I'm pleased to say most weeks it's going OK. Um, but anyway, uh, I think that answers the question. George, do you think I answered it well enough? Yep, I think you did. But I'm going to put another investment one to you now, which was asked by a few supporters, which is what due diligence will be done on new investors, given our history, which you kind of touched on in your last answer. OK, so. We did some of this last time and I think we need to improve it, so. I'm fortunate in all the other work I do outside, I do a lot of recruitment. And it may surprise some people if if you put someone, say, the Abercrombie and Fitch board, where I'm chairman, they go through a complete financial background. They go through a personal background, including criminal offences. And I will personally give an example that we had a big debate at the board about someone who had two um, drunk driving offences uh, several years ago. So that stuff all come, came out. So we'll do that kind of due diligence. We'll pick out personal references. Uh, we've, we're probably also, as companies that do a really deep search on the internet and everything, but what is most important is fin the financial side. And I'm going to give a view here which may... I'll get some people's on my back, not a late Orient, but with everything I hear of 777 who are investing in Everton, I can't believe any league is going to approve them. Now, the Premier League apparently are close to a decision, so they may approve them. But based on the what's happened with other clubs that they run, based on everything that I hear on various podcasts and read about them, I'd be surprised if they do get approval. Well, we need to beat that and make sure that we don't approve anyone just because they happen to have 100 million. We're not going to move just because we find someone with 100 million. And by the way, just to be clear, one of the people we did speak to thought 100 million was on the low side and would be a lot more. So 100 million is just a number we use as an indication. So we're going to be unbelievably careful. Great. Thank you, Nigel. That's good to hear. Um, again, staying with investment, one supporter asks, would the club consider a, the German model in the future where no one person owns more than 49% of the football club? No. no. OK, so the reason, <laughs> reason for that, we're not in Germany. We don't compete in Germany and we want Leighton Orient to be competitive, as Mark indicated before. Um, I think the German model is actually pretty good, but you only have to read today's news that they're all struggling. And there's talk about a breakaway league from the Bundesliga because they can't get their act together over private equity investment. So uh, any model has a problem. Um, I think we also have to be careful that we don't have too many voices involved. You know, no one's more in favour of fan engagement. But Mark will tell you, we've got many people on our board. We've got many people who are significant investors not on the board. And I think when he first joined the club, one of the observations he made to me, and he may want to talk about it, is just how difficult it is with too many voices having a view. Mark, do you want to say anything? I think you've said enough, Nigel. I don't need to elaborate on that point. <clears throat> not if we've got all these other questions to go through, but it's much easier to, uh, to answer to one or two people than it is to 10 or 11 people uh, who may have all have uh, different opinions, as is right in football. So uh, 
Uh, yeah, I don't want to elaborate any further. There's no point, really. But I think the point is, you occasionally find it frustrating when I say, OK, I believe we should do X. And then the next step, I say, yeah, but I want you to go off and talk to A, B and C, right? That's true, Nigel. And, and when I talk to colleagues who do my role in cricket, for instance, trying to get decisions by committee is one of the most frustrating things when you're trying to build a business and, and point it in the right direction and make it move. Because committees and lots of people they do they just tend to have lots of opinions and and it's sometimes you need you need clarity of vision and clarity of decision making and i as i've come from a background where very few people um uh have had to talk to a number of, of people there's nothing wrong with that and it's great to get to a consensus but sometimes you just want to short circuit the uh, uh the process and, and it can be incredibly frustrating when you're trying to make relatively quick decisions there you go Right, a couple more financial ones to come and then there's some more stadium questions to answer. So next one relates to the stock exchange. Would we ever consider placing the club on the stock exchange? I, I must have missed seeing that one. But anyway, that's a good question. These are all good questions. This shows the quality of our fans. Um, I think the answer is probably in the short term, no. Um, I'm chairman of Abercrombie & Fitch, which is on the New York Stock Exchange. I'm chairman of two other private companies, one owned by Blackstone, one owned by another company called Vala. Um, being a private company, which just to be clear for all our British supporters, basically means that in America, it means that you don't have to disclose your accounts. It may surprise many of our fans in America as no company's house. So if Leighton Orient was in America, you could not look at our financials. Um, as soon as we post our financials, we know that someone's going to go on to diagnosis of our financials and analyze it. But uh, so it's slightly different over here. Um, there's clearly opportunities, raising money, raising capital if you go public. I'm not sure a football club with the ups and downs and relegation that we have which obviously you don't have, say, in America, is a good thing. Certain clubs have done it. Manchester United have probably been the prime example. So I don't think it's really on the cards. OK, and then last financial one for now. Uh, Mark, I'll come to you first on this one, which is what are our thoughts on things like crowdfunding or similar to allow fans to invest small amounts into the club? Well, one of the um, one of the things that uh, the board will consider, and Steve Tate um, uh, is currently looking at, is uh, a form of bond uh, to raise money for the new training ground. The new training ground is estimated uh, it will cost us uh, around four million pounds. Um, bonds have been successful in in raising and supporting clubs in certain projects at clubs like Norwich City, Bolton Wanderers, Queens Park Rangers. Uh, they've been project specific. So uh, Steve has been asked by myself and the board to look at these kind of um, opportunities for fans. And we have indeed had a number of fans have, have approached me to say they'd love to help in some way, shape or form. What opportunities are there? So that's something the board will consider. Everything comes with a cost, but it is something for, for the, uh, the board to consider. Those three clubs I mentioned um, uh, ran very very successful bonds so uh, as I say Steve's been asked to look at that we're not 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 ruling it out and it's certainly something the board will consider once they understand fully the the terms of any sort of uh, fundraising that goes on there's there's lots of things to think about um, and that, that will certainly be one thing that we consider great thank you Mark I'll stick with you for the next one which relates to potentially staying at Brisbane Road. Would we ever consider staying at Brisbane Road and rebuilding the whole stadium stand by stand? Well, I mean, that's kind of, it. we have looked at the possibility of Brisbane Road and, uh, and Nigel alluded to it earlier. Uh, if we were to stay at Brisbane Road to, to increase the capacity, even though the number wouldn't be quite, well, it wouldn't meet our aspirations, it would have to be done stand by stand. Uh, and it would probably take somewhere between five to 10 years to complete. Um, 
because you know for instance what do you do when you knock the west stand down with the changing areas the the the, the all the hospitality all that kind of stuff all of our um all of our amenities come in through brisbane road and the east stand so what happens when you do that what do you do with the wave bands when the east stand is knocked down because we will have a duty to um house a certain number of visiting supporters uh, and that would clearly be in areas that currently are are occupied by home fans so any any stay if we were to stay at brisbane road it would could only be on a stand by stand rebuild but i still come back to the constraints whilst we've got the um the type of buildings that are in the four corners and some of the buildings in and around the area uh, we've got a main road as well oliver road is not something that we can really close down and and you know because it is a a fairly busy road anyone who uses it and sees it uh, during the week uh, and also at match days will know what it's like so there are lots of restrictions but the project team did look at brisbane road and the whole idea of rebuild of, of getting to a, an increased capacity was on a complete rebuild it, it we wouldn't get anywhere near the numbers that nigel talked about earlier if we just messed around with a few seats here and a few seats there and bolted them on a bit by bit to stand so it's um it would be a long process a painful uh operationally incredibly difficult and very expensive because you know again just to reiterate what nigel said while this is all going on one full stand would be out of action with all the revenue that we would be missing from that to add to the actual physical cost of building and rebuilding so hopefully that answers the question yeah i think i'd just add to that just to be clear and i think we've shared this before and this may be a year or so out of date. We actually had an estimate of building the East Stand with a hotel in about two years ago. And at that time, it was 30 million. That's just one stand. And that gave us like, what, 1,500 extra seats, something like that. It wasn't particularly huge. Just staying with that. Christopher Gibson on YouTube asks, have we looked at buying the flats on Brisbane Road as an alternative to building a brand new ground? So I assume what he means by that is knocking down the, yeah. the ones in the corners. Yeah. OK, so. There's a painful lesson I had once when I was at Burger King, we bought Wimpy and we managed to buy out all the franchisees and get them convert to Burger King apart from the last one. And the last one held us to ransom and we had to pay a fortune to get rid of them. I think we could probably buy the flats, but there'll be two or three people at the end who will refuse to go. So I think it would be very difficult. It would be very emotional and probably long winded. We have looked at it, but I think logistically and financially it's very difficult because you're buying something you're then destroying. Mark? Yeah, the only way you would get around that is for the council to agree to a CPA or a compulsory purchase order. Um, I don't think it would make us the most popular people in Leighton if we were displacing, even even if, you know, as has been muted to me, well, couldn't you just knock down the flats and put people in the new flats across the road on Oliver Road? Um, very easy to say when it's not you being moved, uh, when you purchased a house with everything that's gone into that, or purchased a flat in this case. So... In fairness to the council, they've asked us to explore everything. We think it's highly unlikely that we would be able to uh, purchase, knock down um, those flats, also be responsible for rehousing everyone. And don't forget, I've already mentioned the the, um, the units at the back of the North Stand, which at the moment are being used by vulnerable adults. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's unlikely we could ever get into that position. But in fairness to the council, have been very supportive. They, you know, that's... Uh, they, they haven't said to rule that out. It just is. It would be highly expensive and and very, very, very controversial, to be fair. And I think there are easier ways for us to achieve our aims than, than that. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, a couple odd potential new stadium now. So one supporter in his question or his or her question said a lot of new stadiums look similar like a lot of new stadiums look very similar and are soulless bowls. How can we make sure that any new stadium for us has soul and similarities to our current home? That's why we got Mark Devlin. That's my answer. Yeah, because yeah, I look like a boring bowl. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, so it all depends on the parcel of land we get. The reason the Brentford Stadium looks so different 
is purely and simply that's what they could fit on the parcel of land which is now surrounded by the best part of a thousand apartments. Um, the soulless bowls, and we had this when I worked at Brentford, the fans were, made the same point. They didn't want a soulless bowl. And they used to refer to Reading and Derby as, as stadiums like that. Now, both those stadiums are really nice modern stadiums, but they're out on the edge of towns in plenty of area, uh, and they tend to be bowl stadiums. That tended to be the modern design. Brighton Stadium, if you look at it, because it had to be built um, to keep ergonomically with the South Downs down in, in Sussex means that it's got, a, you know, it is actually a beautiful building, the, the Brighton Stadium, the way it's been built. The Brentford one is just unique because it's the shape of it is unique because that's all they could do with it. So a lot will depend on, um, A, if we do move stadium, because it's still not a foregone conclusion, but it is, in my opinion, very likely that we would have to and B, the parcel of land and any enabling development around that. And by enabling development, I mean, uh, with Brentford, as I've just mentioned, it's housing. It could be housing. It could be a small arena because the capital is short of small arenas and there are people who specialise in that market. It could be hotels. Nigel's mentioned hotels. Um, so there are lots of ways to, to have a redevelopment that isn't just a stadium, but also benefits the wider community and brings the council what they're looking for as well. So um, all depends on the parcel of land, but fully take on board the point about um, the stadium not being a soulless bowl and trying to make, come up with something that's unique. You know, Wembley decided to replace the Twin Towers with the Arch. I guess we would try and look at something that would make any new stadium unique and stand out on the uh, on the London skyline. So, um, and I think one, you know, fans have also asked whether fans would be involved in it. Again, something I've learned is that when it comes, it's a really tough process. People have, people have become used to sitting in the same areas or with the same group of people. People don't just move in dribs and drabs. They want, they quite often will find groups of people wanting to stay together, get a certain viewpoint at any new stadium. And again, at Brentford, we wanted to try and replicate, but on a much smaller level, the kind of yellow wall at Dortmund. So we we it was we worked with the fan base there to create one end that was going to be for those fans that create the most noise, bang drums, wave flags. Um, and it's important when you migrate to a new stadium that you work really, really closely with your fan base. And I can, I mean, we are years away from getting into that um, discussion, but I can assure you that that that's what would have to happen uh, to make any migration successful. I think I'd say it is difficult. I mean, I see examples over here. I think a lot of people will be aware that in Boston, we have the Red Sox. The Red Sox is the oldest stadium now in baseball, and they've done, and Mark's been there, a spectacular job developing what they have into a modern stadium, but keeping the character of a really old baseball stadium is it's remarkable um so i think it's a really good point but as mark says that's something we have to think about down the road next one relates to the build of a new stadium as well so if when the new stadium build does come are we considering the environmental impacts that that will have well i think uh, I, I think you have to. I mean, there's a thing over here in the States called a lead um, building. Uh, when I was running Dunkin', all our new restaurants were lead. Uh, yeah. Most of the buildings built in the States now are lead. I don't know quite what the equivalent qualification is in the UK, but um, I think we would try and do that. I mean, Forest Green probably isn't the best example this season. Thank you, Forest Green, but... I mean, I think we have to think very hard, long and hard about it. And I know Arsenal, there's actually a video on YouTube about what Arsenal have done, about their power and water and all that. So I think that has to be a major consideration. I just add, George, it will almost certainly be a constraint. And this will apply to the new training ground development that... Um, the uh, part of the planning application and part of us moving forward will be that we will need to comply with um, legislation in terms of environmental legislation. So, and from a cost point of view, we'll want to make sure that everything is is insulated, that um, the way we deal with uh, waste, it's all renewable, heat pumps, 
Uh, we're, look, we're already looking at installing solar panels, hopefully in the summer at, at Brisbane Road, because it's the right thing to do. But we will be we will be held to account by that in, a, in any plan, successful planning application. We'll ensure that the uh, the stadium is as environmentally proficient as possible. And as a business, not only morally do we need to do that, but from a cost point of view, uh, and being you know smart and savvy in operational costs, we will want to do that as well. And by the time we get to a new stadium. Uh, technology will have just moved on so much that there'll be so much for us to take advantage of over the next decade. It just will continue to develop. I think I'm just going to add one point that I think is very important. The London Borough of Waltham Forest, appropriately for sustainable reasons, aren't particularly car focused. In other words, they prefer cars not to be used. They prefer to use public transport. Living in America, I cannot tell you how good London's transport is. I know everyone whines about it, but you take the quality of the Elizabeth line, um, and I happen to know that they've tried very hard to reduce the sound between Stratford and Leighton on the central line. But I really think we have to encourage people to come to the ground by public transport. We currently got 17 parking spaces I think it's highly likely we won't increase it more than a few. Thank you, Nigel. Still a bit of work to do on reducing that sound, I think, between Stratford and Leighton. Um, Transport links was a question from another fan. How important will transport links be when it comes to looking at sites for the new stadium? I think it's critical and it's interesting that um, we had a discussion a few months ago with a major airline and they didn't understand the benefit of the Elizabeth line. And for another project I'm working on, nothing to do with Lake Norrin, I happened to look up on the internet yesterday about the Elizabeth line. And it's significant what it's done to places like Bond Street in terms of bringing people into office accommodation there. It's really stimulated a lot of activity in London. So I think we're very fortunate because Leighton is very well served well, let's say Waltham Forest is very well say, served with underground stations, overground, and then you've got Stratford. Um, and I, I think I've said this before, one of the reasons why I think Idris El Mazuni stayed at Leighton during the uh, window, even though there was offers to go elsewhere, was his family are in Paris. And last time I was over two weeks ago, I actually went to Paris to do some work. I left at 9.30 from St Pancras and I was back to St Pancras at 6.30 and I spent four hours in Paris. Um, And I think that demonstrates how good the transport links are. You then add on the airports. Uh, I often come to see games. I fly in in the morning of a... I'm doing this actually for the Peterborough game. I fly in the morning of the game and I fly back early the next morning uh, from Boston. Now I'm lucky because I live in Boston and it's very far east, but you can do the same from New York. And as we increase our international fan base, which we do all the time through all the good work of everyone at the club, um, that's important as well. And I think it's fair to say, and Mark and I talked about this two weeks ago, we probably missed the continent as a real fan base. There's a lot of people who would jump on the Eurostar to come to London. Uh, So I think transport is absolutely critical. And just going back to the Elizabeth line, our fan base is heavily into Essex. And that should make life a lot easier for public transport for those out into areas like Upminster, Brentwood, etc. George, can I just ask Nigel, is there any truth then, given that Paris is not far away that we're in the market for Mbappe now that he's thinking of leaving PSG. He's, he's having dinner with me tonight, Mark, but well, don't spread that. Well, let, let me know when we need to announce that signing and we'll get Oh, that. George, did we forget to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't aware of that one. Um, last one, stadium related, is... Um, Is the club now looking for a new stadium and our front of shirt sponsor being an estate investment bank a coincidence? 
I, I think it is a coincidence, but Mark did a great job there, so I'll let him talk about it. <laughs> it, it is, it, uh, people should read nothing into it whatsoever, George. It is a pure coincidence. Um, we're very fortunate that he's still our uh, uh, sort of managing partner, managing director. Uh, Jim uh, is a US resident uh, living in London, and I can't tell you how much he's fallen in love with Leighton Orient over the past 12 to 18 months. And uh, just seeing him at matches is, um, you know, he, he's just he's just so, I think fans have actually heard him on podcasts, actually. Um, but uh, Jim Jim's loving it. And it's an it's just an absolute coincidence that they're in real real estate. So uh, people shouldn't read anything into that. In fact, we're, we're just very lucky to have a, a, an excellent front of shirt partner, to be fair. stuff thank you mark right that concludes all of the investment and stadium related questions that that we received we've received a few others i'm conscious we're we're starting to run out of time but okay so we'll get... i think i can go for at least another five six minutes george okay we'll race through as many as we can of the uh the other ones so mark one fan asks will over 60 season ticket prices in the west end go up by 25 percent or more next season uh, what I will say, and we we were open and honest with the supporter groups, is that season tickets uh, will increase next year. Match ticket prices will go up. Um, I don't believe they're going to go up by 25%. We we put we had to, for financial reasons, make that kind of increase last season. Uh, I'm fairly certain they won't be in that that quantum this year, but they will they will go up. Um, but we're also very aware that we need to keep football affordable. Uh, no one's taking it for granted, the fact that we are selling out the majority in, of our games in home areas, that we can simply double the prices or anything daft like that. Um, got a very sensible board, but we're trying to balance that with generating more revenue. So prices will go up, but uh, I wouldn't anticipate them going up by 25%. But I, I need to be honest with fans to say that we will need to make some increases again in uh, when we announce the new season ticket prices and indeed match ticket prices. Great, right, thank you, Mark. I'll stay with you for this next one. Uh, with the club being cashless, how much difference does that make to the club's finances? As talking to local shop owners, they told me it costs them more to take card payments rather than cash due to fees. No, it actually is a lot. Um, uh, I do ante- I, I do fully understand that some of our, particularly our, some of our older sports would love to be able to pay cash. But it's helped us um, immensely. It's reduced our, our operating costs. The cost of handling cash these days is, is daft, in my opinion, but a lot of what banks do is daft. So when we, we weighed it up against um, uh, the kind of service charges that credit card and debit card companies levy, and it's still, a, it's still far better for us, it's cheaper for us, and I do believe we offer a better service uh, by being cashless and the speedy service, particularly around our concessions. That said, again, technology is developing all the time. In time, I believe there will be a way of combining a season card, even though we're looking to go digital uh, from next season as well, but a season card, being able to preload it with cash. And then so people who want to use cash can preload it and use it around the stadium. And I don't think we're too far away from being able to, to launch that. But it's a giant step forward for us. And we need to do it when, when we know we can do it correctly. Uh, but that might be the way around um, helping those guys that want to spend cash. There aren't that many supporters, but that doesn't mean that it's not important to us to try and offer something. So uh, the short answer to your question, George, is there's a definite benefit in being cashless, both operationally cost-wise and from a service point of view. Great. Thank you, Mark. Nigel, next one is for you. So in an article with The Times recently, you mentioned we are filming a documentary alongside Wickham and Plymouth. Could you share some more details on it, please? Yeah. Um, there is a group of us, which includes, and I'll probably forget someone, Wickham, Leighton Orient, Northampton, Stevenage, Plymouth, Gillingham, Carlisle, occasionally Peterborough, who have a WhatsApp group and it's basically banter about the EFL and it's good fun. 
many of these people have become good friends like Kelvin Thomas. I had the pleasure of seeing him live two weeks ago when we won in the last minute, but he he lives up the road from me in my place down in Florida. We play golf together. We have dinner together. We have drinks together. Uh, and he's a great guy. Um, Phil at Stevenage, I'm absolutely determined to beat him in a few weeks, but he's also a good guy. Um, so we all get together and we I think everyone knows this. I've been a bit critical of the EFL in not getting enough publicity out in the US. So the idea was talked about of having a documentary. Uh, we got some sh shrinking violets amongst uh, our group. So it got down to three clubs. So uh, Simon Hallett at Plymouth, Rob Keurig uh, at Wickham and us. So we're filming this documentary. Uh, it's been a lot of fun and we haven't got a title for it, but it's probably something along the lines of the grumpy old men who run football. Um, and it's supposed to be slightly tongue in cheek. It's supposed to be the starless welcome to Wrexham. Um, and the view, and we've got people working on it who've done things like hard knocks. Uh, the view is it's going to be a very attractive proposition for a streaming partner. So we're filming it, and if it all works, and it may, we may fall flat on our faces, we because we're fund, funding it ourselves, including me. Uh, it should come out in the middle of the year. Great, thank you, Nigel. Coming back to you, Mark. A uh, supporter asks, is there a way I can pay for the season of away games? So an away game season ticket, is that something that's possible? There's absolutely no reason why that's not possible. And there's quite a lot of clubs that do have away season tickets. And basically you provide your preferred method of payment at the start of the year and you are guaranteed um, a ticket and your card gets debited with the, the cost of the ticket. So if... Um, uh, the short answer is there's no reason why we can't introduce it. And as our fan base grows, and particularly our, our travelling support um, has, has really grown significantly uh, on a regular basis, uh, then it, it sounds like something we should seriously consider that the ticket office need to work with. So uh, it definitely is operated by a number of other clubs. No reason why we can't do it. We'll certainly look into it. Can I just add to that? I want to firstly thank the fans, because as Mark said, the attendance this year has been spectacular and the noise level brilliant I mean I had that unfortunate 10 minutes at Bolton when I was there but the fans really got behind the team and helped us get back in the game uh, so I've had some several great experiences this year I enjoy talking to fans on the train back though a three-hour Q&A George is a bit more exhausting than this um, but uh I think uh, that's a great idea, and I would encourage fans to go. Uh, people say, why do you like going to away games so much? The answer I always say, I can bring members of my family and friends, and someone else pays for it. <laughs> Good to know that, Nigel. Um, right, that is true. I mean, the, the, it's true. Uh, by the way, the best... That the best food is always Bradford City. Yeah, well, don't think they're going to be with us next season, but no, hopefully no, a year after true. that, they can have a good couple of years. Um, as an O's fan living in Skegness, it's impossible for me to attend home matches without having to spend the night in a hotel. Regarding watching live streams, could the club look into the possibility of allowing supporters who live over a certain distance away being allowed to live stream matches? Okay, let me answer that because this is a big frustration point. So, right back when we were in the National League, we had, I think the only way I'd describe it, pitch battles with the National League over streaming. Uh, I think the National League leadership at the time was vintage 1910. It was certainly before the First World War. Um, and they... They just weren't up to date on anything. And David, my son, who's very involved in technology, pleaded with them. And he tells a great story again to a National League meeting 
where half of them were asleep while they was talking. Um, so anyway, streaming's been something we're very focused on. Uh, we've talked a lot about making it geocoded. And for those who don't understand what that means, you, with technology, you can code out certain towns, areas. You could even code out certain postcodes. Um, it's relatively simple to be done. Apparently, I wouldn't know how to do it. Uh, we've suggested that without success. It's unlikely to change now because the league have done a deal with the EFL have done a deal with Sky for next year. So effectively, the streaming in the UK is going to go to Sky. We're guaranteed four games on the platform. Um, I have empathy completely. And I have the luxury of living overseas where I can see every game. And by the way, just for the record, I pay for my games. Um, and the net result is that I see every game and it's a great experience and yeah, we could probably stick another camera in, but it's basically a great experience. Thank you, George. Um, so I'm not quite sure what to do about it. It's not going to change. I do understand the hotel. Um, I think the only thing I might suggest, Mark, and uh, it's more work for the team. I wonder if there's a deal we could cut with a local hotel for supporters who come regularly. I don't know. That's the only helpful comment I can make. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, uh, I mean, that, that's something we could certainly look at, Nigel. Um, I think we just need to impress upon the EFL. There are fans of, of, uh, who have the same kind of issues as, as the sport living out in Skegness, and we need to find a way to get around that. The rules, uh, Nigel has frustration with them. I have a frustration over the fact that we fans need to understand we don't control some of this stuff, or a lot of it, and you know this better than most, George, as you're... Uh, you're at the sharp edge. So there are things we'd like to do with promotional pricing, with all sorts of marketing, which we're just simply not allowed to do under the rules and regs. So I'm hoping at some point common sense will uh, kick in and clubs will be those, those clubs that want to be really proactive and offer free streaming for fans who, whatever it might be, or, or discounted streaming or whatever, um, are allowed to do that. Uh, hopefully that will come sooner rather than later as uh, as this whole streaming platform. Um, matures. I think, Mark, you got me going there. I mean, we obviously want to build our international audience. What we should be able to do is, because you, again, you can geocode it, say, let's make up a sense in Chicago. Chicago will have free streaming for Leighton Orient fans for the game this week against Bristol Rovers or whatever. We can't do that. We can't even say refer a friend and get a half price. I mean, what other business is restricted from doing the, those kind of offers? Wow, George, you got me all agitated now. Sorry, Nigel. Just to summarise that streaming point, so we are governed by the EFL broadcast rules, but hopefully in the not too distant future, we will be announcing a, a partnership with a company that may prove helpful for, for some supporters. Um, I won't say any more on that yet. Um, conscious of time, have we got time for a couple more questions? Two more. Two more questions, OK. Um, so Is that next what you question. meant, Nigel? Sorry, I thought you'd be yeah. rude there for a second. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it, Mark, in America, we use a single finger, so... <laughs> I, I was giving victory for the O's. <laughs> Church so, all couple, time. couple more, then. Um, so why are players being brought in on undisclosed fees? That's not very transparent of us. OK, I think everyone does it. It's basically most cases. And, and it's worked really well for Lake Orient. So uh, let's take one. Ollie O'Neill, who I think we all agree is a talent. We Martin Ling deserves great credit for watch, watching him when we play Fulham, identifying him as a player. He then... Fulham allowed him to come and train with us. He probably had somewhat of a unsure future at Fulham. We decided we wanted him. And Fulham then, I think, realised, yes, this is a talent. So it's a win-win. 
where we sign a player basically for nothing and then we give them a, a share of any upside when we uh, sell, if and when we sell the player. Uh, we got the same arrangement with Hector Cipriano when he went to Peterborough. And I'm pretty well informed that Peterborough turned down a multi-million pound deal this summer, uh, this winter for Hector, who's a great guy, by the way. Um, uh, except he's got to make sure he doesn't play well against us when I'm over. Um, so I think uh, it works very well. I do appreciate the lack of transparency, but I think that's the way football's developed. And I think the best way to think about it is a sharing arrangement. Great, thank you, Nigel. And we make this next one the last one, <clears throat> which is: Could we offer singular tickets cheaper when games are close to selling out to encourage more people to buy the last tickets? I'll come to you, Mark, for that one. So, if I understand that question correctly, where a game is really popular and close to selling out, we should reduce the price of the ticket. I think the question refers to, you know, like sometimes in the cinema, for example, if there's one seat on its own, would we re consider reducing that the price of that seat? Uh, we certainly haven't. Um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to have an open mind on pricing policy. Um, and we learn a lot from our American cousins sometimes with dynamic pricing, which has been introduced over the years. So I think we will look to evolve our pricing, George. Um, we haven't thought, I mean, there uh, there's a there's an expression. I mean, I think some airlines don't allow you to buy certain seats so that you don't leave uh, a seat on its own that nobody wants because generally people want at least two seats. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, it's something we'll look at, George. Not something that I would, but we just don't have enough seats at the moment generating revenue for us to reduce the seats, for uh, reduce the price further. But in a bigger stadium, um, where we want to, uh, with dynamic pricing coming in, there's no reason why not. But at the moment, um, I, I, I don't think it's something that I would be going to the board with, purely and simply because if we're not selling seats because they're all singles and it's causing us, a, a statistically, it's causing us a problem, we'll certainly look at it. But it's not, it's not really cropping up as an issue at the moment. So therefore, there's no likelihood really at this moment in time of us doing that. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Right. We'll we'll leave it there for now. There's a few questions that that we didn't manage to get round to. And there's also quite a few on YouTube as well that we didn't manage to get to. So we'll do another one of these in a few weeks time, maybe at the end of the season. Um, Nigel, before we sign off, I'll give you the final word. Um, just you. your message to, to everyone watching. Well, firstly, I say again, thank you to the fans. You've been absolutely spectacular this year. Um, I actually played the drum, as some people will say, at Bolton. So I think the drum was a good good innovation. Um, it certainly sounds better on the stream and live. Um, I think we're excited about where we are. I want everyone to be very clear that we're not going to hedge away from promotion. And we continue to look at potential players that may or may not come in. Um, just in case there's anything we can do to improve the squad. Um, Richie has done an awesome job and we continue to believe that we can find a way for him to stay at the club for a long time. Um, I think the stadium discussion is important. We wanted to share it with you, but we've owned the club for six and a half years now. I think it's highly unlikely that we will have another stadium within six and a half years. So, um, so this is long-term thinking. I think the fans should feel pleased we're thinking about the long-term. And in the meantime, we have to struggle to find every pound we can to build our revenue because that's the way we're going to have to be able to compete with other clubs. So, you know, everything we can do, improving the South Stand Bar, encouraging uh, the supporters club to keep supporting our activities, to make sure the fans use the ticket exchange. These are all part of building our revenue base, which will hopefully give us an even more competitive playing squad for the future. But onward and upward, big game tomorrow night. Uh, and I ask everyone to get there, get there early, support the team, 
and make sure we get three vital points. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Nigel and Mark. We shall leave it there until next time.